here. Um, so first off, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for another Love Your Columbia summer webinar series, Debate on Tribal Rights Heats Up, Stand in Solidarity with Yakima Nation. So my name is Simone Anter. I'm Hikaria Apache and Yaki and a staff attorney at Columbia Riverkeeper. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by Jeremy Takala, Yakima Nation Tribal Councilman and a Kamisma Band member, and Elaine Harvey, fisheries biologist and hydro coordinator at Yakima Nation Fisheries and a Kamisma Band member as well. Um, they're both here to talk about the Goldendale Pump Storage Hydroelectric Development, which threatens irreplaceable tribal cultural resources, fish and wildlife for speculative energy return. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So following the presentations, we will have time for a short Q&A. So please make sure to use the chat function to send in any and all questions that you may have um, as they pop up. But we will be saving questions for the end. Uh, so now before I pass it over to our speakers, I wanted to give a little background on this proposed development. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So first, what is being proposed? So Rye Development joined by Copenhagen Infrastructure's partners wants to build a massive pump storage hydroelectric development along the Columbia River's banks in Klickitat County, Washington near the John Day Dam. So the Goldendale pump storage development would be the largest of its kind in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and the development itself would excavate two huge reservoirs, the Hilltop Reservoir, which would be span 60 acres, and then the lower reservoir, which would cover 63 acres. So despite being called a closed loop system, this development would actually require withdrawing millions of gallons of Columbia River water for initial fill and periodic makeup. Could we go to the next slide, please? All right, so what exactly is pump storage? So pump storage generates hydroelectricity for peak periods of demand. So when electricity on the grid is abundant, rye would pump water from the lower reservoir into the higher one. And then when there's a demand for electricity, the developer would release water in the upper reservoir through turbines and back into the lower reservoir. So this development has the energy generating capacity of 1200 megawatts and rye claims the $2 billion project would be complete by 2028. Surprisingly, this is not the first pump storage development proposed in this exact area. The last proposal was actually denied by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC in 2016 because the lower reservoir would have interfered with cleanup of toxic soil and groundwater at a former aluminum smelter site located in this area. And then next slide, please. So what is the status of this project? So at the state level, the Washington Department of Ecology has initiated the state environmental review process. And ecology has already determined that the development may lead to significant adverse impacts on the environment. And so is requiring an environmental impact statement. Just last month, ecology also denied a key permit for the development because Rye failed to provide necessary information on major project impacts, including wetlands and streams, groundwater and pollution from contaminated sites. So that aluminum smelter site that we were talking about. So without this Clean Water Act 401 certification, the project cannot proceed. At the federal level, FERC has also begun the federal environmental review process and requested scope and comments to determine what to include in its environmental review and what level of environmental review to conduct. So in response to the developer's license application, FERC has sent additional information requests, um, three of them for more information and studies that need to be completed. And then if we could go to the last slide, please. And so as our speakers are going to elaborate on in great detail, Yakima Nation has been disproportionately impact by, impacted by hydro, wind and solar development on their land. Yakima Nation has also vocally opposed this project since its inception because of the detrimental impacts to sacred cultural resources, fish and wildlife. Uh, Columbia Riverkeeper stands in solidarity with Yakima Nation in, in opposing the Goldendale Energy Storage Development. Um, it's imperative that our green energy future is also one that is environmentally just and conscious, which means the developments such as Goldendale are not fast tracked through the licensing process under a green veneer in the name of a climate solution. And with that intro, I will go ahead and turn it over to our speakers. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, 
Elaine or, or Councilman Takala. I don't know who wants to go first. Um, thank you, Simone, for having Jeremy and I um, join this webinar in regards to the water pump storage and impacts to our, our cultural resources and natural resources in the area. Um, I have a PowerPoint and um, to go over our connection, um, the Kamitpa Band in relation to Yakima Nation um, to the, this water pump storage and, and other uh, energy projects that that have accrued and are proposed in our area. Uh, I also want to say uh, good, good afternoon, everyone and participants. And uh, thank you, Simone and Columbia River Keeping her for, for having us on. And uh, I guess uh, my name's just introduction. My name is Jeremy Tacala. I actually live just out of Goldendale. I am uh, one of the uh, newly elected uh, Yakima Nation Tribal Councilmen and I serve on the Fish and Wildlife Committee and with that, also, I, I was uh, I'm a delegate for the Klemmer River Intertribal Fish Commission, which the chairs just rotated actually last week. So I was the chair uh, conducting uh, such as this Zoom or go to meetings. You know, it's, it's been quite a year with the pandemic. So uh, we just rotated the chairs now. And so I sit as the treasurer for Klemmer River Intertribal Fish Commission. And I also serve on many other committees uh, for the, the Yakima Nation uh, Tribal Council. So uh, appreciate everyone's uh, time for allowing us to be here and to, you know, give some uh, <clears throat> um, words, you know, and concerns that we have as far as the bands and tribes of the Yakima Nation with this proposed project. Thank you. So if y'all can see my um, PowerPoint, and, I, and what I want to talk about is the Kamipo Band, also known as the Rock Creek Band, and we are one of the 14 confederate <clears throat> tribes and bands of the Yakima Nation that comprise the Yakima Nation, and um, we're located in southern central Washington along the Columbia River. Um, here's a map that I wanted to show to some of you who aren't familiar with the Yakima Nation Reservation, the Yakima Nation Ceded Lands. Um, in the green, you can see the boundaries of the Yakima Nation Reservation. And um, in the orange color, you can see the Yakima Nation Ceded Lands. And then we also have the usual and the custom lands where we um, retain our rights to fish, hunt, and gather, which include the Columbia River and in Oregon in Northern Washington. The usual and the custom lands are far extended past the seeded lands. Where you see the, um, the uh, purple star down below, south, south of the Yakima Reservation, this is the area where the water pump storage is proposed. And it's also the area where the Kamitla Band is from. Um, in, the, in the lower right photo, you can see um, the Rock Creek watershed. And um, this area, the Rock Creek watershed is an area where the Rock Creek band, Kamitla band is from. And where the yellow, yellow star is at, and that is where the water pump storage is proposed to be. Here are some um, historical photos of our, our longhouse at Kamitla Rock Creek. We had a TP longhouse and prior to um, our people utilize Thule mat longhouses. Um, <clears throat> and now today we have a modern longhouse that we still utilize, that we still gather, and um, we still have our annual feasts and ceremonies here in the Rock Creek Canyon. We still have that connection to this land. And um, we still live here even after the treaties were signed, even after everything has, ha has happened over the many years, um, our Kamithla band members, we still live in this area near Rock Creek. Um, as part of the 1855 Yakima Nation Treaty with the US government, um, we reserve the rights to uh, fish, hunt, and gather in all usual and custom areas, like I explained in that map where we have the reservation, the seeded lands, and then the usual and custom areas are extended from there where we 
we um, retain that right to fish hunt and gather all our roots and berries, medicines um, in all these areas. We still practice our traditional gathering. We have, a, we have our own calendar. We have um, our own seasons that we go, that we follow annually. Um, and right there and where this proposed water pump storage project is, is where our first food is coming from in the spring, where we, we gather our foods there, we gather our salmon right there at the bottom of, near the John Day Dam. And we also gather our different plant species um, on that mountain, on, um, on the sacred mountain from the top to the bottom. We have our resources there and in our people, our band has been utilizing this area since time immemorial and since time immemorial. And our ancestors are still here um, on this land with us. So um, I just wanted to show this picture that all year round we're gathering these different salmon, fish species, uh, plant species and berries. Um, we still practice our ways because it's it's our ways and, and we have to continue it on. As I mentioned, um, we still gather these uh, foods here that are really important to us. They're part of our life. They're part of our culture, our ceremony, and um, in all these different resources, they're a part of this land. We go all the way up to Mount Adams to gather our berries. We go, we go down to the Columbia River all throughout the different areas of the Columbia River to gather our salmon, different fish species like the, the uh, Pacific lamprey and the different roots and berries. So we're still actively practicing our culture. That was in these rites you know, go tie back to the 1855 treaty where our ancestors ensured, they wanted to ensure that us, the descendants would retain the rights to gather these foods and medicines. Um, just another photo of, of um, what we do and what we gather throughout the year. And we honor our foods every year and um, as well as the water in, it's all a part of our life and our culture. Um, <clears throat> the dams, I want to start out and talking about how green energy and how these different energy projects has impacted our people. The dams on the Columbia River started, you know, back in the 1930s and continued on into um, the 1970s, 70s. <clears throat> on the main stem Columbia River, there's 14 dams that um, are located on the Columbia from Bonneville Dam all the way to up to the Snake River. And all these dams, they impacted all the different tribes and bands that lived along these rivers here, the Columbia, the Snake River, the main stem, all the way up to Canada. And um, today there are 274 hydroelectric dams in the Columbia Basin. Um, and on the main stem Columbia and all throughout the different tributaries. And all these dams, they have a big impact. They've displaced our people. Many villages were lost. They were removed by the Army Corps. And um, a lot of our fishing sites, thousands of fishing sites were lost with our main one being the Salilo Falls. And um, my ancestors were removed from the Columbia River. And, and now today, many of the village sites along the Columbia River are now state parks, county parks. Um, and, and those these parks are village sites of our people that everyone gets to live on on today. And my grandmother, she had a home at Mary Hill, right right below that bridge area, where the state park of Mary Hill is. That was her home site when when the Dow's when the Dow's Dam was constructed. She was she was removed and left homeless. So these dams had a had a great impact on our people. Um, we lost our homes, we lost our villages, we lost our fishing sites. And now today the dams impact our salmon and all the different fish species that migrate through. And some of the fish aren't even able to migrate through because of the dams. And then back in the early 2000s, the, the wind farms came into our area. Um, <clears throat> 
and they had a big impact on, on the Kamitha band and other Yakima Nation bands that utilized the area. All throughout the Cedan lands, there are wind farms. And these wind farms, they impact the wildlife. They impact in the birds. They impact our access to our traditional root grounds. Um, there are many gates that are locked that we cannot even access anymore. Um, and there's only, and I can say this, there's only one landowner in the Gundo Hills area. He's, he's been really um, grateful. Uh, he opens his gates for us every year so that we can gather our foods there for our first salmon and root feast. And we're grateful today, you know, for him to open his gate and the rest exclude us. So when these uh, green energy projects come in, they totally exclude us. And sometimes, you know, they take over the land and, and they ruin the, the habitat where these plants grow. And the impacts to the wildlife are deer, they're not as abundant in, in the good no hills anymore as they once were. So the, everything gets impacted by these projects. I was gonna show this YouTube video. It, it shows, it's just a flyover drone of um, area. So if you're able to, you can watch it. And it, it just shows the wind farms and the potential, um, the site of the potential uh, water pump storage. And here's a photo of um, Patush. That is the name of our sacred mountain. And it is located right here on the right. So from the Gundo Hills, so from the Eastern Gundo Hills, look into Mount Hood, you have the Columbia River here and then you have Patush. And you have all these wind farms here up on top of the ridges. And Patush is our sacred mountain. It's been um, a sacred site for our people for many generations. And, and today that's where this proposed project um, is planned to be. And in the right photo, um, my friend, <clears throat> she, she worked with the Yakima Nation Wildlife Program. She shared this photo with me and um, she was doing uh, vegetation surveys of the area. And so as you can see, there's juniper, there's a variety of different um, plants here. This is a real beautiful place, as you can see from this uh, right photo. There's so much um, diversity of, of plants, shrub step plants, and traditional plants that we gather and use for different purposes. And at the bottom of Patulish is our fishing site. It's the area where our families, we still fish here. We fish here on the scalpel. Um, Many of my uncles and my brothers and nephews, they all still continue to fish here on both sides of the river on Oregon, Washington. But this is our, this is our life, fish, the, the plants, the different medicines um, and the wildlife. This is all part of our life. And um, these projects, they impact our way of life. Um, <clears throat> Here's a photo um, of the proposed project, the Golendale Water Pump Storage. So up here on top, you can see this was where they want the reservoir. But this whole area up here is where, is on top of the uh, Gundo Hills area where we, where we um, have our traditional foods that, that grow all up in this area. Even throughout here, we get our first foods. And then this is down here is where we fish. We continue to fish. And this whole area is also known as Asnam. And um, my, my mother's family is from this area. They're called the Willow Whites from Band. And they're from this land here from Mary Hill all the way to John Day. And it's really important site for our family, for our, for our family and the Kamithbal Band, because we're all connected uh, to this sacred site, the Patalish. And this, this particular project is not the only one in the area. Um, this is, this is, was taken from the um, Northwest Fire Council's website. Um, they did an article on water pump storages in the Northwest region. And here's Goldendale. And then you have many other water pump storages in the Columbia Basin that are planned. Um, Badger Mountain is also an important one to the Yakima Nation. It, it, um, it's located in the Wenatchee area and um, 
is an important place where the Yakamas do. It's where the Wenatchee Plums of our tribe, the Wenatchee Plums are another band of the Yakama Nation, and this is their traditional lands where they're from. So there are many water pump storages uh, planned in the future. You know, they have applications in there. Another um, potential impact that and it's actually happening now is um, solar projects. There's the Lund Hill Solar Project in, located in Roosevelt, Washington. And it's not too far from the water pump storage. And they actually have this green line here where they would, um, you know, this connection of energy from this solar, proposed solar here um, is gonna be transferred to the, the um, substation up on Goodnow Hills which goes to the, uh, which would probably be connected to the water pump storage. But this is a really large area and this is just one solar project here. And that was like phase one, Lund Hill Solar. Now they have a pos another proposed project called Bluebird Solar in, in the same vicinity. And so this whole area, you know, be covered with solar panels. And, and this is um, important uh, winter and deer habitat for um, for the deer populations in the winter. And um, here is another band called Pow and Put. And this band is, is real close related to the Kamithpa band, we're close related. Um, this is a, a location of their ancestral lands here. And in the solar project is directly impacting the, the Pow and Put band and their resources. You have the Wood Creek and you have Pine Creek coming in here to the Columbia. And these creeks, they provide um, habitat for salmon and steelhead. And so these projects do impact the fish when, when they're rich on water from the, from the um, aquifer of these two tributaries that are not even perennial streams, they're um, intermittent. And there are fish you know, that live in this uh, creek, both creeks. So industrial solar, as well as wind and, and uh, this water pump storage and dams, there's cumulative impacts to the Yakima Nation's cultural resources and natural resources of the area. And that's what we're concerned for. And some people ask, well, you know, why are the tribe, why is the Yakima Nation so concerned about, about these and, and to, to me, I just think about our future, our, our younger, our children, our grandchildren, and our future generations. And we want to protect what we can for them so that they can experience um, fishing. They can experience gathering these foods, these different berries, the, the roots, and um, the plants. And that's why we, we go out of our way. That's why we um, want to protect, because that's what our elders have been for us. And um, so that's the end of my PowerPoint. And I just wanted to share that with each one that, that all these, that all the resources from the Columbia River, from the, um, the mountains, the different areas, and, you know, they're really important to us. It's part of our land where we're from. Our ancestors are still here on this land. They're buried here and our children, they're still coming. And we have that vested interest in, in all these areas from Mount Adams all the way to Columbia, because um, we want our children to be able to benefit from, from, from gathering these different foods and partaking of our ceremonies and, and learning, learning our ways. So um, thank you. That's the end of my slide. I'll try to stop sharing, but. Was, did you wanna add on, Jeremy? Uh, sure, a, a little bit. I, I appreciate the PowerPoint slide Elaine provided. You know, I, a lot of the things that she's touched on, you know, have, again, have been practiced for, for many, many years since time of the immemorial. And to this day, you know, such as, you know, the seasonal round, and now we're looking at um, our huckleberry fields, you know, which is, you know, in, in our in our seasonal round, it's one of the last few foods that will be here, and then, you know, we'll go into fall and winter, so, 
you know, the area here, such as the background and, you know, that the, this is a, a food source area as well that provides us uh, different roots and medicines during the springtime. And there aren't many places like this, and which is why you can obviously tell with, with the, the, the topography here, the elevation and the slope, you know, it's, it's you know, for, for the development, you know, it's, it's, it's for obvious reasons, you know, this is a, an area that we um, want to protect. Um, you know, we, we've heard, you know, the, the area here of a, a potential effect, you know, as, as Elaine said, put the lish or push pump, you know, and specifically, you know, about nine traditional cultural uh, properties, you know, two, two of which are, you know, National Register of Historic Places. Um, you know, th this, this project here is definitely going to impact, you know, like uh, two streams, you know, one I believe is on the Swale Creek, which is down below. If you're familiar with Gold Mill, you know, some of that um, watershed includes right, right, right there of the north side of this proposed area. And so, you know, working with uh, Clickitat project for the Yakima Nation Fisheries, you know, we've conducted many steelhead uh, surveys and electrofish and pit tagging in Swale Creek. So, you know, it is a it is a steelhead barren stream, you know, which we want to make sure that we protect. And not only that, you know, with climate change that's occurring, you know, we're seeing the impacts of uh, shorter winter seasons, less snowpack, um, you know, warm and water conditions, which, you know, I know for many of us here on this uh, webinar here are well aware of the, the sockeye issue and sturgeons that, you know, the, the warmer river temps that they're facing uh, today. Um, it was also brought to my attention as well, you know, that the, the project would require, you know, 7,640 acre feet of water, you know, for initial fill and an additional 360 acre feet of makeup water each year. That's each year, you know, so taking water from the Clement River will more than likely happen. And again, you know, water, water is a definite need for our anadromous and resident fish, you know, as we all know, especially like sturgeon, you know, they, they won't utilize fish ladders. So they're landlocked in these pools. And so when we continuously take water from the river and we're competing with flows and, and power, the, the, the demand for power in, in the summertime, you know, these are some of the things that, you know, all of our resources are up against. Um, you know, so, so, you know, for the, it, it's a fact that water loss will definitely occur every year um, from the river and these two ponds that are proposed, you know, with seepage or evaporation. And not only that, Elaine touched on, you know, our, our wildlife, you know, you talk about um, eagles, uh, golden eagles, prairie falcon nesting habitat, you know, the cliffs that are utilized here. You know, um, I, I know, I know for a fact, you know, when the, the wind, wind turbines went up, you know, we've, we've, um, we've seen some, some, some birds lost when we're up there gathering during our uh, spring uh, gathering purposes. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's something that, again, we, we hold dear to heart. Every animal has its role. The river has its role. Everything was laid out, just like how our, our creator placed us in this area. You know, we're not to move, we're not to leave. We're supposed to uh, li li live, live in harmony with our, our, our animals and our medicines, our, our mountains around us. And you know, when the treaties came, you know, that's that's still to this day, it needs to be honored and recognized that, you know, we still have the exclusive right of taking fish in all streams. And not only that, you know, with with that included hunting and gathering roots and berries, you know, and this is one of those areas that provides for us. So, you know, I um I know, you know, these these projects are really fast tracking, you know, but you know, Yakima Nation has been tracking this in, in the beginning, you know, um, even before I got in with previous council members, uh, previous cultural resource managers, you know, that, that aren't, aren't here today, but, you know, the fight still continues, you know, and one of the things, you know, that we, we felt that was really kind of, um, you know, we were supporting some of this, this, this projects, but at the same time, you know, being at the table is is definitely something that's needed because we want to make sure that we're not 
faced in a situation such as you see the hydro systems, like Elaine said, you know, flood in our village sites, flood in burial sites, even in the tributaries, you know, like Elaine, Elaine and I know this, you know, our ancestors within Rock Creek, you know, many, maybe many of those that aren't on this uh, webinar don't know, but, you know, that's what, what happened when the John Day Dam was constructed, that we had people living in Rock Creek and Pine Creek and John Day River area, and then they were told you're going to be flooded out, but it only flooded so far, and then we were, we were removed from our homelands, you know, Pine Creek as well, you know, they had um, a, a band there that lived uh, year round fishing to different fisheries that were provided along the river. You know, same thing, we were gonna get flooded out. Then next thing you know, uh, war came out and then they were utilizing that canyon as a target range, you know? So there are many, many um, negative impacts that we have suffered in the past from our, 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 uh, our that our ancestors have gone through. Um, again, you know, I know these, these projects were being fast tracked, you know, and we want to make sure that, you know, our animals, our wildlife, and even us don't, don't, you know, we have, we've always seen the face, the burden of these projects, you know, it's always, it's always our people and our animals. Um, you know, one thing I really felt that was, uh, uh, uh from our, our governor, you know, is veto and the, the, uh, consultation, you know. And, and that's what Yakima Nation always strives for is government to government relationship as we are, you know, one of those. And so, but yeah, not to, to, to not make sure that we acknowledge that the treaty, you know, that if, if we feel that, you know, we can object this and then that the, the treaties must be honored, then there you go, there's our veto. Like we don't want this project here in our area because we maintain that right here as well as many other gather and hunting uh, berry picking sites that we continuously uh, do to this day and will pass down to our, our children and our grandchildren. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I guess another thing too is, you know, it, it, it has to be us that determines what is culturally significant to the tribe. You know, I know sometimes we, there's other contracts that are seeked out to do a study when you know we have it right here within our own tribe you know it it's really disturbing when these companies come in and they contract somebody out who has no idea of the yakum nation or the bands they have no idea what kind of issues we're we're, we're dealing with to this day when it comes to you know fish and wildlife or, or foods foods and medicines so you know, that's, that's one of the things that, you know, we seem to get bypassed on a lot, you know, and of course, this area here is, is the destruct, destruction that will take place will, will be irreplaceable. Um, you know, I mean, uh, there, there's a history, there's a story behind these peaks, and, you know, it, it, it's taken thousands of years, thousands of years to form, and just like that, you know, it's going to be taken away if this is to go through. Um, you know, there, there's, there are moral and legal obligations to consider alternatives permanently damaging cultural resources. Um, you know, uh, again, renewable technology by definition, you know, should not result in permanent resource destruction. And, you know, it seems like the, the application, you know, is greenwashing, you know, the actual cost of development. Um, you know, again, our, our people have carried the burden of the national energy development, you know, including the destruction of cultural properties and the loss of treaty protected gathered hunting and fishing access, um, you know, with, with dams, wind, uh, solar arrays, and even transmission lines. And, you know, we've, there's so many projects within our area, which, you know, we have, have it right here along the river, but we also have uh, other proposals in our northern um, lands, you know, where we have our, our different bands, such as the Wenatchee Pum, you know, we have the Wenapums that gather, you know, just by, um, you know, the town of Wenatchee, you know, and, and we have, again, I've seen someone mention Hanford, you know, these are so many issues that we're dealing with here. And again, as I heard before, you know, we're going to be here, you know, our neighbors are going to be here, and we have to make sure that we're gonna provide, you know, something for our future generations. You know, that was one thing again that my grandpa has told me, you know, is when you're my age, there probably won't be no fish when you're my age. 
you know, and that was really concerning, you know, and I see it as, as, as a father of two, you know, I see the things changing all around us, you know, again, like our sockeye that are, are struggling right now in the, the, the main stem, you know, so we, we need to really consider um, what, what impacts will happen with these projects, you know, clearing the land, it's competing against the wildlife. Um, so I just want to offer these the, a few, and and I don't I'm, I don't want to keep going on because, you know, there's a lot more to, to add. But you know, again, that's that's how our people understood our rights when these treaties were made. That this is how we understood it: that these rights, these areas, will be protected for our use, future generations to use as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine and Councilman Takala, um, so much for that. We have a few questions that popped up uh, while you both were talking, and I know you touched on a few of them briefly, but um, I'm gonna go through them and uh, can go ahead and answer them. So the first question that came through the chat um, is, is there a way to switch to green energy and, and avoid hurting the hunting and gathering grounds of the tribes? So that's a pretty, it's a pretty large question there. So I don't know, Elaine or Councilman Takala, if you want to answer that. Yeah, I'll, I, I can try to answer part of it. Um, I think that green energy, you know, could be good and it could be, um, it could work best if the companies and the counties consult with the tribe prior to siting, including DNR and BLM because they're moving into green energy, um, you know, they, they're promoting and, and actually doing solar projects um, throughout the state. But um, consultation with the tribes at an early stage um, is beneficial. So, so that the tribe can have input on, you know, where they want to plan these energy projects um, so that they're not planned on a sacred site or, um, you know, important fishing site or a gathering site. So I think early consultation with the tribe at the, you know, at all levels at the state, county, um, it, you know, would be beneficial for, um, for everybody. Cause I'm, you know, the Yakima Nation isn't a hundred percent against, you know, green energy and um, they're, and I think green energy can benefit and is important, you know, with climate change happening now. And, and so um, my best dealing with these projects here in Klickitat County, if, you know, if these uh, companies and, and state officials, you know, worked with the tribe early, you know, we, we wouldn't have so many issues with them right now. So I, I was reading the chat box there and I, I, I like to comment that someone, uh, this is dandy, you know, what about individual solar on urban roofs? And that's, that was my exact thought too, you know, why does it have to be such large scale projects that's gonna require, you know, a permit for water to constantly maintain, uh, you know, projects, especially again, we're in, a, we're talking about large scale projects, of course, in the east side of the Cascades, you know, where we're, you know, rainfall isn't that much, uh, you know, these are, again, uh, proposed in areas where they're sometimes, you know, intermittent streams where, you know, we're requiring a permit, which is going to require a well and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's competing against our anadromous fish. So, and, and residential fish, I mean, you know that I that's that's the only thing I, I could say. I mean, like Elaine said, consultation with the tribes. I guess you know ha having a seat at the table or you know letting us um, I guess make I guess hearing us, hearing our comments, hearing our concerns as where and where can these projects go through or where can they not? You know that's and you know I don't know if if the governor has you know something like that in mind, but you know I hope you know, to hear us out, you know, and, and, and one thing too, you might want to, I guess for everyone, you know, 
their information is, is Yakima Nation, the land is, is, is covers quite a bit, like in the landslide, you know, so, you know, we're, we, we have a lot of land base that we have to look out for and protect. And, you know, again, our, our I think our biggest projects for Yakima Nation is our fisheries program. You know, we're located uh, quite, quite throughout the north, south, central uh, uh, state of Washington. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I would be concerned, especially when it comes to archaeological sites. You know, we have our own cultural resource program who, who goes out, you know, it, it'd be good to utilize them. You know, we, that's why we have it in place. So um, that, that would be my, my comment, just to add on to the lanes. Thank you. I think also just tying it back specifically to this project and going off of what you said, you know, the developer in this case even hired your own cultural resource program to do, you know, an archaeological survey of the area to document the cultural resources. And when the response came back that you can't build the project in this location without, you know, irreparably destroying these resources. I mean, when that's the answer that you get from these surveys too, there needs to be an action from that. It doesn't just go into an application that then the project continues forward. Um, all right, so we have another question here. So would Councilman Takala and others comment on whether local governments, including the tribe and comprehensive plan and zoning development that designates areas for wind and pump storage and sets or fails to set conditions such as preserving tribal access to important plants and places Will proposed state legislation to require formal tribal participation help ensure local governments include the tribe's concerns? I think you can read that one in the chat too. I know that was kind of long yeah. <laughs> to say out loud. <laughs> So I, I guess that was one of the things, uh, again, I think Elaine mentioned it, you know, is access. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to kind of balance out two things is, is where the projects will be located at and then how much impact will it have. And I mean, if a, an area is going to be heavily impact, you know, such a, or such a large area utilized, then, you know, definitely there probably won't be no gathering areas that you know we need to have access to such as you know for 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 different medicines and roots um but that 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 is one thing that the tribe is is you know we we need we need that government to government um consultation you know to 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 have have a look at these proposed projects and see where the development will take place at you know, for, for wind or these this pump storage projects or solar panel. But, you know, again, I guess just focusing on this one, you know, um, I, I, I just feel like we're not, we're not on, on the sides of, of moving forward with this at all. I mean, I don't know how many times we've, we've told the, this project, you know, no, you know, I mean, I think since 2018, you know, we've, we've been responding to this proposed project, you know, again with the past leadership, and now here we are with, you know, a few a few uh, newer leaderships that have, you know, taken on the similar um, decision that our past leadership has. So, um, yeah, I, I hope that answered your question. I mean, that was a long, long question. <laughs> I would I would like to make a statement that. Um, Jeremy and I are part of the Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission. And um, it's also known as Quit Freak, as some of you know, but we've been working on an energy, they've been working on an energy vision plan. And um, I was a part of it and part of the energy vision plan, it's a tribal energy vision plan, includes the um, siting of, of alternative energy projects and in relation to um, potential impacts to cultural resources, sacred sites, archaeological sites, fishing and hunting sites. So that plan 
is still um, being reviewed, but it will be ready. Not, I'm not sure exactly when it'll be ready, but um, it's a pretty good document that the tribes could utilize in the future, the Columbia River tribes, the four treaty tribes, because you know our lands on both sides, Washington and Oregon, and Idaho, you know, these are areas where these um, alternative energy projects are, are, you know, aimed at that are ceded lands of all the tribes. And so this, the Quific Energy Vision Plan, I've read it and reviewed it. And I think it's a really good document that addresses our concerns for um, all the natural cultural resources. And also, um, I know the um, Northwest Power Council, you know, they're working on an upcoming the, the Power Act update. And, you know, hopefully the energy vision plan will be done before that to incorporate some of the tribe's concerns into that document because the power, you know, the power plan is, you know, talking about power and energy into the future. Thank you. Um... So the next question is, uh, Governor Inslee vetoed the sentence in the climate bill that dealt with the necessity to consult with tribes regarding any proposed project. How do we get him to right this wrong? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, you know, I was, just, I was just thinking about my, my response when, um, I found out the news about Inslee Vito and this, you know, he he had many tribes on board with this, this uh, climate bill that was being, I guess, I guess, I felt like it was rushed, but at the same time, you know, he pulled the tribes in on this as kind of utilizing our language on trying to get the bill, I guess, perfected, you know, and that was one of the things that Yakum Nation, you know, was standing firm by was consultation with the tribes, you know, Again, you know, many tribes are a little bit different with the land base that they cover, you know, some may be heavily developed, some may have, you know, um, a lot of land base, you know, ceded land such as Yakima Nation. And, and I was just thinking about that time when, when he did that, you know, cause I know our, our the AT&I president, you know, had a statement in regards to his veto and to veto it, you know, in the Duwamish, lands, you know, and, and I know there was quite a bit of reaction from some of the um, participants there, specifically a tribal member, you know, and, you know, uh, I'm not sure if anyone's well have, has seen that video, but there was a video on Facebook that was being shared about the reaction and, you know, and he, he, he you know, would not really acknowledge the, the gentleman that was, you know, making a good point, you know, you you ask the tribes for your help and your support, and then you go and veto the main biggest section or language that we had, we, we, we've helped, we've helped you with this. And, you know, you basically backstabbed the tribes and, you know, hoping that this would go through, but at the same time, you know, we still have our, our, our treaty that stands firm, you know, that, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's the treaty and that's, that's what protects the land that we're talking about here. You know, I know we had a, a previous uh, tribal attorney that, that, you know, had uh, something in our, our local paper that says, you know, if in the future, if the government desires to develop projects and they're, you know, objectionable to the tribes to which impact cultural sites, the treaties are our veto, you know done but you know it and and i've i'm wondering too you know i think a part of that too is maybe he he is going to start um and he or he should include the tribes with these other projects that may try to uh be proposed but you know again you know we're we are in a situation where climate change is happening but at the same time i want to make sure that the tribes are included and that we can give you know our our comments, our um, our vision as well, like Elaine said, you know, especially, you know, if it's gonna uh, involve areas that are still utilized by tribal members. So this question um, is not quite in order, but I think it kind of goes uh, with, with the question that you just answered and, and kind of the necessity for that language that 
ended up being vetoed. But so when the tribe says no to a project because it violates um, your treaty rights, I don't understand how the project developer can still go forward. Would you explain more about this, please? Um, yeah, Elaine, I know you deal with a lot of, of projects like this and, and maybe, maybe you could explain a little bit more how that works. Well, I know with some of the projects um, that I kind of dealt with over the years, um, one, one in particular is a solar, um, our Yakima Nation Cultural Resources submitted comments and, and concerns for that project, but there are, there are also always um, <clears throat> issues in regards to, to fisheries, to water, um, wildlife, and so our different departments do work um, send in our concerns and comments when when the environment on the EIS or the CEPA during the CEPA process. And, and in some cases, well, and there's always the different mitigations. And then if cultural resources, if, um, you know, if something's found at the site, you know, they, the project has to deal directly with the Yakima Nation, cultural, our cultural resources. Um, <clears throat> For instance, um, the Lund Hill Solar Project, if they come across some kind of archaeological um, evidence, then you know that's kind of when they deal with the tribe. But but the Yakima Nation did, you know, submit all the documentation and concerns for for that project, and and they do for many of the projects that are you know sent through the tribe. But um, in some cases, the tribe takes takes it at, at another level to to court. And also correct me if I'm wrong. So in a lot of the, the environmental laws and the and then the federal laws that they're going through, there's the requirement for consultation with tribes between the developer and, and the tribe. And often it's just looked at as kind of a, a check the box, like, oh, we sent a letter, we sent an email, no response, or we received a response, but you know, there's no need kind of to take further action in response to that. Is that in a nutshell kind of correct? <laughs> Yeah, that that's that's pretty much how how we felt, you know. I mean, again, we try to have these consultations or communications, you know, with with you know different departments, you know, such as ecology and and NEPA and 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 so on, you know. I mean, again, I, I think Elaine and I know with these different projects, we're always, you know, our, our emails are just nonstop and trying to keep up, you know, and and I, I, that's kind of how I really feel. It's just like a checkoff box. I mean, you know, for Yakima Nation and, and all, uh, you know, consultation involves the, the full tribal council, you know, it's not just having or delegating some individual to go ahead and speak on behalf, you know, no, it involves the full council. Um, it, it, because it goes back to, you know, our, our treaty time with the, the signatures that were um, on, on that treaty of 1855. So, you know, I, I, I questioned that too. I see in the question there that, you know, the, the, the not understanding how a, a project developer can still go forward. Well, you know, again, you, you, you talk about green energy, you know, I mean, I hear people call it the green lie, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of, again, you have many groups that are siding with this green energy project, you know, and it looks all good and dandy, but at the same time, you know, there's always impacts to any of these projects, you know, and this impact right, right here is, you know, right in the heart of our, our area of the Columbia River, you know, and we've are, we already have a lot of issues already on both sides of the Columbia River, uh, particularly, you know, not just main stem, but, you know, tributaries, you know, and it's not just what's in the river, but it's, you know, what's, what's the surroundings, you know, what kind of impacts are being done around it, you know, such as, you know, landfills, um, what's seeping into the, the, the groundwater, or like I heard someone mention Hanford, you know, 
uh, many uh, PCV contaminants, you know, that are left, you know. So every one of these projects, past, present, or future, will always have an impact. So we have about six minutes left um, and I'm gonna kind of combine this question. We, we have a few questions on, on what can, you know, what actions can we take to prevent this project from happening? And then, you know, what can Oregon politicians, tribal leaders and nonprofits do to help with this as well? Um, and before I pass it to our panelists, I'll just mention that, um, as we mentioned at the beginning, there's concurrent licensing processes at the federal level with FERC and at the state level moving forward. And both right now are uh, starting to conduct environmental reviews. So there will be lots of opportunities to submit public comments and attend public meetings and get involved in that way and just continue um, to voice and echo these concerns. Uh, I think a main thing that we can do uh, you know, is not, like we said at the beginning, not to just fast track these projects through, but make sure they're being reviewed and that these concerns are being um, spoken at, at all levels, federal and state. Um, I would like to, I would like to talk a little bit about um, an example of what just recently happened in Douglas County, which is near Wenatchee. They were planning to do um, a few, or more than a few, but um, solar solar projects, which were quite large, um, 6,000 acres and, and more um, in the area of Wenatchee on top of the ridges and also a water pump storage over there called Badger, Badger Mountain. <clears throat> and um, with us getting awareness out through Seattle Times, through NPR, OPB, different, um, you know, getting the awareness out that these green alternative energy projects are impacting cultural resources. Um, they went through um, <clears throat> multiple iterations of public hearings at Douglas County, where the community and the community citizens of the county went in, did public hearings, partaked of it, sent letters in. Um, they brought back concerns of the tribal use of the area and the and they knew they they lived there for a long time these are just um you know citizens farmers ranchers and they brought back that concern for the sage grouse critical habitat and also for the the tribal uses the Yakima Nation tribal uses of that particular area and so with the awareness that we're bringing out and the organizations that contacted me uh, we worked together and and you know the county commissioners of Douglas County um, created ordinances for alternative energy to protect sage grouse critical habitat because they're important species of the area of the state, and also the cultural resources that are you know in the area with you know large buffers to protect these areas. And um, so I think you know just getting awareness out so that people you know you know we're we're there, you see us, you see us fishing, hunting, gathering. Um, you know, like Jeremy said, you know, we have a large area from the Columbia River all the way up to, you know, past Wenatchee and into those different watersheds. And, you know, we can't address everything, but just with getting the awareness out through Seattle Times, through, you know, social media, um, people are getting, you know, are assisting us in protecting our areas of gathering such as the sacred mountain Patalish, the well no pump storage area so um i just wanted to bring that out is you know getting awareness out and thank you columbia riverkeeper for assisting us with that also you know on social media and different fronts and um just thankful for that because um i know relatives who go to wenatchee and gather foods there and you know that was a big concern of them for them was you know, are these solar going to totally take out, um, you know, their gathering grounds, and are they going to totally take out sage grouse habitat? And so, so just getting more awareness out so that communities statewide, Oregon in Oregon also, you know, are aware. We go to Oregon and gather foods as well, and you know, these areas are targets for green energy projects.
typically to these types of projects have very long licensing processes. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to keep talking about it and, and to share these concerns. Um, so with that, it's almost one o'clock. Uh, Councilman Takala, I don't know if you have any final words you'd like to share. Well, you know, I, I guess most recently, you know, and back uh, last month in June, you know, we did hear back that the ecology denied the clean water certification, you know, without prejudice, but, you know, that doesn't mean it's over, you know, there's still a fight that continues and, um, you know, we're going to keep a close eye and ear out and see what, you know, what's going to, the, ne the next potential move is, but, you know, again, the Yakima Nation stands for monopolizing these projects and we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that this, this doesn't go through and, Again, you know, I, 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 for all our panelists or our, our, our uh, attendees here, I just, you know, one thing I, I really feel is, is the lack of, um, you know, with our, our, our people as our neighbors is they're not really informed on the historical trauma or, or you know, things that we've faced in, in, in the past. And, you know, that burden still continues today, such as Elaine mentioned Silo Falls, you know, many of us wish today that, you know, we can fish these places, you know, we wonder how, what it was like when there was a free flowing river, you know, rather than just lakes or stagnant water. Um, but, you know, again, I, I really, I, I wish we could have <laughs> got to everyone's questions. I, I seen the, the mining, you know, well, if there is any, you know, negative impact to our resources, our lands, the Yakima Nations will more than likely, we are, we are battling mining, mining situations. But, you know, I guess I'll end on this note, you know, that our, our people that live in the area, you know, that's where we're replaced by our creator. We will continue to carry on our ways of life. There is homes, longhouses, such as Rock Ricks, Salilo, um, I know Lyle is trying to get theirs, you know, addressed and, 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 you know, we have temporary structures that are utilized for gatherings and, and honoring the, the, the first foods, the feast of our, each of our foods. And that continues today that, you know, that whatever is going around in the world, you know, such as this, you know, that our, our, our band members are still carrying on our original way of life and it'll continue to go on. So. Um, again, like Elaine said, I, I, I encourage everyone to get involved locally, you know, if these projects are coming around, you know, have a, make sure, make sure we read the fine print to see what's going to take place, what's, what it's going to evolve and what kind of impacts studies have been done. So thank you. Thank you both so much. And thank you for everyone for joining um, this webinar. It will be uh, on ColumbiaRiverKeeper.org's website, on our website, recorded, as well as sent to folks who RSVP'd um, as a YouTube link if you want to share it or just to watch it again. Um, yes, make sure to visit ColumbiaRiverKeeper.org. Uh, we will be keeping our website updated on public opportunities uh, to stand in solidarity with Yakima Nation in opposing the Goldendale Pump Storage Project. So thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.